All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Regenerative Foods webinar. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's been a rainy and dreary day, so for you to get back on the computer, it means a lot to all of us. <laughs> My name is Dakota Stock. I am a conservation director with Conservation Nebraska. A little bit about what we do is we are a nonprofit that works through Serve Nebraska and AmeriCorps, and we serve throughout the entire state. So there's conservation directors in Scotts Bluff, Omaha, South Sioux City, and we go into those communities and we kind of pinpoint what environmental aspects and things they are worried about or want to find solutions to, and we provide educational things like this. So yeah, <laughs> this one is going to address food insecurity and more importantly, nutritious foods. And as we know in Omaha, there are a lot of different areas that are hit harder than this. So Graham and Duan have put together an incredible paper since they are both, they both have a degree in journalism. So they have come together, joined their forces and put together this incredible paper that they are going to address here in a little bit. While we're still waiting for people to come in, I just wanna let you know that you can't be seen or heard, um, but if you would like to be heard, you can definitely raise your hand throughout the presentation and I can let you speak. I know that sounds totally weird, but, <laughs> but I can definitely do that so it's more of a conversation or you can type any questions into the chat or the Q&A box. Feel free to do that throughout and Graham and Dewan are happy to address those questions. A little background of these two is Graham Christensen, he's a fifth generation farmer. He still helps operate his family's farm while also being the founder and president of GC Resolve and GC Re Result, Revolt, sorry Graham, and Regenerate Nebraska. Um, he graduated from Midland Lutheran College with a degree in journalism. And as I recently said, Dewan also graduated with a degree in journalism. He was formerly the communications manager for the Union of Contemporary Arts and is now the director of NOIS. So thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate you. Take it away, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> well, so I think um, Dwan and I had talked a little bit earlier and we're gonna um, each cover different parts of, of um, this conversation tonight. So we'll do a little bit of back and forth. Um, <clears throat> Dakota and Dwan both also said that if anybody has questions during the conversation, just to chime in, um, we're pretty laid back. And um, for and then hopefully, you know, we have a little bit lengthier discussion at the end of the presentation. So <clears throat> I'm kind of the setup person um, tonight to start off how we got to the second paper. And I think um, in this, this, um, this work that we're doing, um, it's really important to give context of some of the background on the first paper as well. And then and then um, when I turn over to Duan, we'll basically take a deeper dive into the um, nutrition piece. And this, this piece about neglecting nutrition was just released um, about a week and a half ago. So this is fresh um, uh, for everybody to um, be able to view and, and talk about. And I guess we're just thrilled to be able to talk about it with this group. So thank you, Dakota and Conservation Nebraska for, for thinking about us on this. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Um, there is a, a new network or coalition that's formed across the country. And it, it really takes a, a real diverse group of people that come from you know, the farm production area like where I do to, to inside the meat packing plants to inner city representation to medical professionals and, and, and also I'd say with, with um, diverse uh, political backgrounds as well that have, that have decided, hey, let's um, work together to try to dissect some of the issues that we're facing and then come up with regenerative solutions. So Dewan and I have definitely connected over the past year um, more and more around you know, this, this thought of regeneration. And you know, I've always talked about regeneration and it starts with how we take care of the soil which leads to all these other great things when we focus on that foundational piece that the food actually comes from. But uh, regeneration, I think um, Dewan himself would tell you that goes beyond you know, that, that's a starting place, but it goes into our communities, it goes into ourselves. Um, 
but one of these components again was that in order to regenerate we have to build have access to good nutrition prep rural was the name of this coalition pandemic research for the people is 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 what that stands for what that acronym stands for and this this has a rural focus um, but what's been intriguing about the conversations as we've moved forward uh, we've noticed that we can't really talk about rural with the intersectionality of urban and and you know Duan and I each kind of represent different factions um, myself a little bit more rural uh, him a little bit more urban but both of us you know um, definitely are able to to relate to the other side and see how these two need to be bridged better uh, the first paper that was released focused less on nutrition but more on national security and the piece was actually called fixing COVID-19 related disparities and the national security threat of a fragile food system. Uh, this is something that I've seen play out um, being from a fifth generation farm in Oakland, Nebraska. Uh, I grew up and, you know, doing, I, I, I like to um, farm when we weren't farming. A lot of times I was spending my time playing sports. And if we weren't doing, if we weren't tra uh, traveling around doing some of those kind of things. Our family a lot of time was like lobbying for a better direction for the independent food production system and so that we can you know have um a, a better future in that world um that i think if, if if there would have been more wins back then we wouldn't have had to bring up these issues the way we are today but COVID 19 certainly opened up our perception and understanding of many of these things and it comes right back here to nebraska and and uh, omaha specifically um, the first paper looking at national security threats started started highlighting how the meatpacking plants have become hot spots for COVID-19 and the workers in there have become more susceptible. And there's been kind of a lot of um, what I call skimping on human rights um, that these companies have allowed to move forward in order to try to continue to meet public demand for food consumption. So it creates a, um, a what can be a kind of a dicey area. And um, what played out is what we saw is that the big meat packers started talking about how things were slowing down on the lines as the food was processed in facilities, once again, many of um, which are housed in Nebraska and several in Omaha. And as there was more infection going on within the sites, um, obviously those lines had to slow down unless food was able to get out. At the same time, you started seeing the public demand more local food um, you know, you've heard about more people doing more hunting and, and things around food security on that side for themselves. Um, well, we saw more people wanting to do those kind of things, which included just having a direct relationship with the farmer, which is a trend that we really appreciate on um, that direct consumer to uh, farmer relationship. But shortly enough, the small independent processing facilities in a lot of these uh, small towns, they ended out being filled up as the public had more demand for local products. And then as the big companies slowed down, they started dumping into these little meat packing plants and the small and mid-sized farmers that had these local herds were pushed back. Some of them from COVID last spring are still not processing, able to process their foods until 2021. And now you can see how there's accessibility issues for more people. Um, so we have a deficiency. And when you have accessibility issues of food, there becomes a security threat um, that becomes serious. At the same time, uh, Tyson's um, one of the top execs, uh, he, he made statements along the lines that we're not gonna be able to fill up and keep up with the demand in the grocery stores. And then we find out they're exporting more to China. So we have to take a different look at the structure of our system if we're gonna be able to um, move forward in a way that really honors the opportunity for everything, everyone to have fundamental human rights, which include food accessibility. And so just kind of fast forwarding um, through the examples that this paper laid out um, that are very stark and once again come back and focus right on our very own state here in Nebraska, um, we established six actions that we thought could be able to further protect people, well really protect our country from having a national security situation from, a, from this fragile food system. And the first one that we laid out was going to be, was the obvious one. And, and um, there are conversations going on now in the legislature around this issue that I think um, uh, everybody should pay a little bit closer attention to, but that's increasing the meatpacker um, worker protections, pay and safety standards. 
because those essential workers are crucial to getting the food out on the line. Um, they are the last stop, um, but those folks are often the difference between any nutrition, whether it's, whether it's the best nutrition possible, but any nutrition at all. Um, and of course, everybody needs nutrition to survive. So, so obviously the first thing, the first standard of business and the first action is we call for an increase in those worker protections, which still hasn't been honored at the state level. And meanwhile, the federal government is speeding up the lines on the processing um, by laxing uh, long time federal guidelines. This has to be straightened out. The other thing that's creating a security threat is that over the last, this is the seventh year now, we're just getting data in from this, that the average farmer will have gone in the red or negative or backwards. Um, and you know, as a business, for those of you that you know follow the business world, you can't have a successful business and go in the red six, seven years in a row, um, which creates a whole nother issue that is very disruptive of the food system. And so the second piece that was identified as a federal piece of legislation um, that should be opened back up and is called antitrust legislation. Many of you may remember back in the day during the jungle, uh, there was a book in the early 1900s that exposed bad practices within more monopolized meat packing plants. Well, we're seeing this circular thing happen again where there's, a, a, there's been so much deregulation that's allowed these folks to function in the form of a monopoly as there's only a couple that big ones that that really hoard a lot of the market. And that means they control the farmer's product and they control who gets it and what you get as well. So it's made for a non-transparent and uncompetitive and in many cases, just unaccessible market for farmers. That's a, that's a security threat um, when the consumer doesn't have transparency and the farmer does not have security. Um, so that needs to be opened up to be a more competitive mechanism. So there can be more people that are a part of the problem and function fluidly as businesses that are producing food in this case. The third one breaks it down to a state level uh, solution. Um, and that solution, also part of the regenerative solution, is to allow there to be more distributed meat processing plants across the state of Nebraska. Um, or, or really, this is a priority that needs to happen for food security everywhere um, across the United States. And by allowing for a state inspection program in Nebraska, we'd have our own state inspectors and not have to be reliant on federal inspectors with the USDA who aren't, who don't seem to have the energy to expand and give us a state inspector on more of these smaller sites. And so an investment into a state inspection system um, could be a huge benefit that could allow for more rural business growth, as well as growth in areas of North Omaha and South Omaha um, who have, in rural and in urban, who have people that have great skills to be entrepreneurs or start new businesses around these skills that can help develop local and regional markets that protect, pr protect and enhance our food security so that more folks have access and of course access to local fresh products. Uh, so that was a piece we discussed and there was also talk about farm subsidy reform. So looking at the farm bill and starting to invest in more of these local and regional markets, um, but also starting to invest in the next wave of young diverse farmers that can come onto the land and um, be a part of the solution to, to securing our food security. And um, number five was a state level um, uh, uh, conversation as well. And that was resuscitating corporate farming bans to keep the big boys out like Tyson and Smithfield that, that um, are using these kind of more predatory practices on both farmers and workers together and freeing up that independent business model that was such a solid place for the middle class um, in, in, in um, in prior years to now, which a lot of the rural middle class, for example, has been depleted. And I think the same goes for some of the trends we've seen in urban areas as these things are trickling in, um, no one's exempt. And then one other area in food security that we identified was bring back a grain reserve so that if a disruption like COVID or a big flood happens, that there are ample grain reserves and that farmers are being paid to be able to store them on independent sites, which creates another revenue stream um, that people call a safety net to help prop up farmers to be part of that, that security solution. So that really set us up for the um, conversation on nutrition, which this larger group had said that they wanted to focus on and, and talk about as one of the key issues. So what, who's getting impacted when the food system neglects our nutrition? And, and, um, and what does that mean for us? And so, um, so uh, Dwan now is going to 
um, preface, you know, how we, how, what, what happened in those conversations and start setting up, you know, where we're going to have to go from here if we want to be able to make sure that more people have accessibility to nutrition, which once again, basic nutrition is a, that's a fundamental human right. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Graham. That set up quite a bit, you know, that early run into like taking that larger national view is really important to bringing it back home and really exploring, okay, that's bad. What does that mean for us? And what do we do about it? Um, you know, for me particularly, I'm born and raised here in Omaha um, and only within the last few years have I been able to see more of Nebraska and in that explore, exploration I've been able to see like, whoa, there's a massive disconnect here that people can grow, that are growing food or growing crops all across Nebraska. Many of those crops aren't going to places like Omaha or Lincoln that we eat. Uh, it's often being you know processed in the state or out of the state um, for industrial use and so we end up in this place where we're constantly depleting land and not at all like restoring those nutrients to the soil or to the people um, that are present. And when, uh, as we were having that conversation, we brought back to like, okay, we recognize that this uh, like vertical farming and this like, this reductionist approach is really like, it's taking a huge toll on our overall health. And we recognize that like, okay, humans, we've been able to live for thousands of years up to this point, but now we have cancer rates that are astronomical. And why is that? And it's often because we are, we've put so much into our environment and we've also depleted the, the natural sources of our nutrients that we are, uh, that we're falling apart, <laughs> frankly. And so with this particular paper, um, which I'll share the screen so you can get a sense of the title, could you share co-host with me? Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly look at it and we'll make sure you y'all get the link so you can look at it as well. Um, but it just really outlines that this is a, that this is historic precedent. This is something that we have seen um, impact civilizations throughout time is that when we when we begin to um, do a this more unilateral approach and, and, and reduce our diversity in our environment in farming in our commerce in our communication styles and strategies in our cities as we try to become more homogenous and concentrate powers we often we uh, we corrupt absolutely um, because there there isn't a sustainable network in order to support to support the communities and the environment be, um, due to due to the, the lack of access that's being it's being made affordable. And so with the with this second paper, we really wanted to explore like who is most impacted by COVID and why. And we see that COVID has the most impact on communities that do not ha that have underlying health conditions. Well, what are those underlying health conditions? Many of those things are what are, are known as um, uh, th that are are known as everyday lifestyle behaviors that directly impact how we interact with the world. For example, if you have a Whole Foods nearby that has access to a plethora of different products and um, in foods and ingredients that are like that are better aligned with your body, say you need to be gluten free or you're vegan or you're plant based or you eat meats, like you have a selection and it's a high quality selection that is available to you, you are, you are then better able to eat food that benefits your body. If you do not have that level of access and you're, it's reduced to you know, prepackaged, processed, um, cheap, uh, degraded foods, um, or a limited source uh, access to produce, things like that, your, your um, your health directly suffers from it. So we have to, so in order to be able to like move forward, we have to understand first the disparity and then two acknowledge, okay, well, how can, what can we do about it? And the biggest response to that is by localizing our food system. Um, you know, right now, a lot of our food product comes from other countries or from California. And um, as we've seen, California is on fire and there's massive drought and there's a lot of these environmental disasters that we now are trying to, um, as that's being threatened, now our, now our food is scarce. That doesn't make any sense. We live in an agricultural state, but most of our food doesn't come from the state. 
like <laughs> and the, the largest cities don't and distributors don't have um con, you know contracts and service agreements with all with like this grain belt that we live in that's that that's a huge that puts us in a really difficult position and so um here's that paper i'm gonna scroll to the top so this is what it looks like uh, neglecting nutrition how a pandemic has exposed health disparities in the rural u.s and um i love this intro because it just like there are le lessons to be learned we've seen this before we're literally the most uh, connected humans in human history and have access to the most information possible it is there is no reason we ha we sh should have to encounter these um grave outcomes if we're paying attention and we're willing to communicate and work together to address it. And this paper does a good job of one, bringing many different voices together, and two, exploring the various lenses that we can look that we can look at it through. And so, like poor nutrition is fundamentally, if you don't have your basic needs met, it's compromised. Um, and then here we can see data amongst obes obesity rates and how that how those things have increased significantly since the 90s. And we're in a place now where most of the country is red due to, uh, you know, the degrading nutrition. And when you have more fast food restaurants than you do grocery stores, farmers markets, bodegas, um, farm stands, things like that, you find that then um, people are eating less greens and more fried potatoes, which I love and admire, but we have to, we have to strike a balance. And then especially, particularly in rural communities, as we've seen um, due to health insurance and issues like that, um, we've seen lots of hospital and medical systems close in these areas. And so access to a, a lifestyle physician or someone who can help you uh, or nutritionist, um, physical therapy, those types of things increases the rates at which people encounter obesity and therefore other things like high blood pressure, um, heart disease and, uh, and diabetes. Um, and uh, so we're in this place where what's happening in what's happening in rural America is exactly what's happening in in our in our urban cities, and they're because of the very similar reasons. Um, and as we move through here, we see you know like chronic and infectious diseases prey upon the poor or in those who don't have the luxury of access. And um, you know if you for example, in Omaha, in North Omaha, I live in a food desert. If I want to go get kale, I would have to go to Saddle Creek um, or Wolner's, but or like the Bakers on North 30th. Um, if I want to find like fresh rosemary, like you know, just like these kind of simple things, I want to go find a plant. I have to like get out, go out of my way to do so. Um, and that puts us at a significant deficit because we recognize that communities of color are impacted by these, uh, by disease um, significantly. And the big reason of that is because of nutrition. And if your nutrition is determined by how much money you make, then that, that puts us in this, that puts us in this cycle. And so here's an example of, of like food consumption and how right now the disproportionate um, percentages of the composition of our of our, the average American diet um, and how processed foods make a significant portion of that and also requires some the the uh, produces some of the most greenhouse gases and emissions in just its production um, and so we go from you know only we grow the plants but then we spent all this time processing them into these cheaper degraded forms and then distribute that in plastics and then it produces more waste and we we get this we get this cycle um and then you know this is um just looking at the especially the rates between native americans uh and black americans and uh and hispanic americans versus white and asian americans when we're talking about um poverty covid 19 and and uh, infection rates as well as like rate mortality rates um, and we'll continuously see how economic instability um, 
co directly correlates with people's access to healthcare and nutritional foods and the value in this. So I highly recommend um, going through the paper because it provides some really strong sources and number data, um, and then some cites some really effective studies. This is a great line about a life expectancy and how they're uh, and how they are deeply connected um, by, and determined by race at this point. And in this, in within the state, you can break it down to zip code. Um, you know, you can look at the zip codes that have the highest mortality rates, and that if you live in six eight one one one, like I do, versus someone who lives in six eight one th uh, three two, which I think is like Dundee. Um, the, is a 12 year difference in mortality rate in the same city. And I, and I bike between my neighborhood and Dundee on a regular basis. Um, so, and we can see this across the country, urban, rural. And if you would just map out where grocery stores are, access to cooperatives or markets, produce, um, nutritionists, medical specialists, those types of things, you'll see a, a direct correlation there. Um, I, uh, this in this this will start moving into our our points into like what do we do and I really love this sentence here like food failures don't start on the store shelf the U.S. heavily subsidized production system which artificially lowers the price of crops such as corn and soy is producing food primarily for confined animal feeding operations instead of direct human consumption we have to recognize that that like oftentimes the argument is made well there's just not enough food there's not enough money and I'm like literally there's so much food and there's so much money but it's going, it's literally going to waste and creating more like harmful conditions that will ultimately degrade our ability to raise nutrition. So, um, you know, it's, and it's one thing to like blame the consumer and say, well, you should just buy local, you know, and like, yes, we can, we do have the ability to make those individual choices, but for most people, how their urban environments are built and how their just communities are designed is to make them reliant on the supermarket model that that like that has concentrated all these production systems, and if they're compromised in any at, at any time, which we've seen them significantly compromised this year, slated to get worse, it puts us in a position where we are extremely vulnerable and our disconnection from the soil and recognizing like what it does for us and everyone becoming active stewards of the soil puts us in a position where you know we um the, the these markets are getting more and more rare but what's really beautiful and going into i think i can start to move down into our points um is that we're seeing this this direct movement into like we need people are scared <laughs> people want security and so a big response to that is how do i grow a seed and how does that seed turn into food? And how can I grow it? And where can I do that? And um, I, th I think our five action steps can really help us look at the practical uh, implications of, of this rather dastardly information. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, actually, Graham, would this be of use to you or should I take it down? Um, no, I can um, actually just kind of stay with it and roll down and I, I have my own version to read off of too. Cool. Um, yeah, do you want to, do you want to just touch on number one and, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll pick up from there. For sure. So healthcare, um, and how we define it has to be accessible to all people, um, and create a focus on proper health, nutrition, and illness prevention. Healthcare as we know it right now is designed to respond to symptoms, um, that don't ultimately address the roots of the ailments that we encounter. And something that's really concerning right now is that one, uh, with COVID-19, we've seen some of the highest mortality rates that we've seen from any new disease in a very short period of time that we recognize many of, uh, that there are challenges between the healthcare system and our, in our governance and our city applications. And so um, there's this, there's this uh, severe lack of agency that people are experiencing when they're like, okay, are we supposed to just wait for a vaccine to address it? But ultimately vaccine isn't going to address the underlying issues that have caused this in the first place. Like we really have to address the symptoms that have put us in this position. And, you know, the, the, our simple health directives should have worked, but the, re the big reason they did not is because of so many of the unsustainable systems that we are embedded in, uh, with. And so with healthcare, um, 
what we can do is begin to um, is reprioritize what the the focuses of healthcare are right now. It's a reductionist and uh, it's a reductionist approach that tries to just like address the pain point at that moment, rather than thinking about how do you build a whole full body of health, and that includes nutrition, exercise, vitamins, um, sun exposure, water quality, air quality, sleep quality. These. Um, you know, the sustainability of your home, does it have enough ventilation? Does it hold moisture? It those it starts that sort this health starts turning into really real applications that we can start to take control of rather than um, just be affected by. And these are what are called social determinants of health. Juan, that's awesome. Um, thank you for the beautiful setup. Uh, yeah, so one of the alarming statistics in here is that. Um, these trends, uh, uh, this nutrition trends in our country is culminated in a population in which 70% of people are overweight or obese, and 60% of those in that obesity category are malnourished. Um, the second action that we wanted to take now and, and um, uh, was around education. So in doing some investigative work around the educational system and in Nebraska specifically, where we're more of a local control state on educational curriculum, schools have options to, school districts have options to choose from different things that have been written um, as, and implement them at their, you know, at the, at the K through 12 level. And, um, and so we have, a, we would have an amazing ability, I think, um, if, you know, there was support around this area to be able to design curriculum that can enhance um, the education of our young people around soil nutrition, soil health and nutrition. And of course, you know, right now, um, I hope we get into talking about specific nutrition that we can access right now, but we have to be concerned and make sure that the next generation of young people doesn't fall into the same trap that all of a sudden that we spiral down into um, in the current generations that have made us so susceptible to COVID-19 or what could be, you know, bigger and badder things in the future. So, so that we need to firm up that education. We need to design curriculum uh, that allows just more of an emphasis on what we consider fundamental things. And that is soil health um, where everything starts and that nutritional aspect. Um, um, it starts with the education. That's the foundation to everything. So we have to get back um, to the education uh, and of our young people so that, that we can eliminate these, uh, this, this definite systematic issue um, in, in the future, uh, just eradicate it and it starts with the young people. So the number three, uh, the emphasis, the third action now um, that was regenerative uh, to um, being able to deal with this nutrition neglect is a, a transition or a just transition that will help farm, farmers that are existing out there that are caught up under this, the current system are becoming less and less profitable and also are yielding some environmental destruction, especially as a whole. Um, and that is how do we be able to shift to more of that soil health focus when we've whittled away all our protections and now the big companies are plugging and playing systems all over the place, um, just outside the city and upstream from your guys' water supply. Um, well, obviously we have to first honor the people that are a part of this system and we don't leave other, you know, of our friends and, and neighbors and family, even if you don't completely agree with where they're heading, you know, a lot of this, they didn't have a choice. And I think like we have to like be able to remember that there are people, these are our neighbors and friends, and, and it's just way more proactive to have them to be a part of the solution. So looking at transitioning existing farmers that are caught up under the model that are probably inching slowly towards bankruptcy or playing high stakes poker um, in, these, in this, um, in this uh, high market world and, and, and in this era of big land grab, um, and, and, and bring them into the solution. So that's worth an investment, you know, to be able to sort that out. And part of this even takes it, peels off another layer and suggests, um, you know, then starting to make sure that we have more um, support in farm bill to be able to transition young new farmers onto the land as the baby boomers transition onto the, onto their, um, the next steps, the next level. And uh, a lot of that land over the next 15 years is freed up. Um, we don't want to see that land go to multinationals that are, have been the root of these problems 
who are becoming more and more foreign owned. For example, the pork giant Smithfield, who is Chinese owned and is starting to invest more in our own agricultural assets, which creates another layer of that national security issue. We would rather see more young, diverse farmers come back to the land over these next 15 and 20 years and be part of that regenerative solution that includes reduction of emissions with more biodiverse systems and, of course, um, grazing systems that, that, that bring livestock um, back to the land and, and help do some um, uh, fertilizer enhancement in a more natural and aligned uh, with the ecosystem way. And so, while we had um, uh, on the, I think, dietary side of things, a really interesting mix of folks on, on uh, this conversation. Um, there were vegetarians, vegans, you know, total pro meat, you know, all the way folks. Um, but the paper ended out saying after we all kind of put our heads together that maybe more of a plant-based diet is good, but meat is still, you know, you have to have the animals on the land to be able to reverse this climate change system and work with the ecosystem. And it's, a, it's pretty near impossible to think that you're going to cut out meat protein from the system. It's actually essential to a proper running system. Um, if, it's, if, it, if these products are spend more time on the land and, and in this ruminant type opportunities, the nutritional value of that product is also going up as well. And so, so even though we had this mix of folks, it was still deemed necessary that that you know livestock were going to be a part of the system, and so was meat protein. But it was more fundamental on on how on how the animals were being utilized as part of the system, um, which definitely there's a lot of data out there to to show that supports um, higher nutritional value as well. So I thought that was one of the most interesting things about the dynamics of the conversation, um, and more so than meat being a worry, is processed meats or Pro, a lot of processed foods by the industry that have a lot of sugar substitutes and excess sugars that you don't need. Those are where the real underlying issues to the concern, not really just a concern of meat or not, um, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of what the group ended out um, supporting overall um, as, we, as we move towards just transition of this food system. Um, go ahead, uh, Dwan. I think I wanna uh, pass the torch back over to you. <laughs> Great. For yeah, I think it's really important that we recognize the balance of our diets and how dynamic they can be rather than, um, you know, li limiting it. And I think a big important way of doing that is addressing the local and regional market systems, because when you can localize your farm, you know where your product is coming from, you recognize that it's coming, it's higher quality because of the regenerative nature of how it's being fostered and, and raised, then we get ourselves in a place where it, it's less about quantity and more about quality of the food that we in, intake um, and, the, and the demonstrable impacts that, that those practices have. Um, that affect our overall quality of life, water, air, um, soil, especially. And so with the regional market systems, we're, you know, education around SNAP, because SNAP for a long time had a bad rap of like being food stamps, but really like people need food. So if we have a mechanism to use to like get people fed, then let's use that mechanism. Um, there, and there's, there should be no shame around, um, getting food. And I think if, especially because it's coming from our collective tax dollars and we recognize everybody eats. And if the, that those resources were going into our local and regional markets to our, our local farmers, then we're in a place where that's good. It sustains our local systems and it makes sure everyone's fed and it produces high quality nutrition that prolongs our health and increases our quality of life. So like I at all times, I think it's important to think like, what do we want the outcome to be? And let, and instead of worrying about like how it's paid for, because ultimately the the money is what gives us access to the resource. So let's just get access to the resource. And when we can do that, that's where like the the land education, the soil awareness, um, you know, waste of like regenerative farming can really uh, be super beneficial in the long term. And then last but not least, stress. Like, we are stressed out, y'all. Like, this is, this, I mean, there's lots of reasons to be stressed out. There's lots of reasons to be upset. There are lots of things to be worried about. But we need, we need real tangible practices that can help us, like, 
chill out so we can get our minds together to figure out what we're going to do next. And so much of our food and our, our ways of living right now are severely degrading our ability to, uh, um, to acknowledge and relegate our stress and um, instead kills us by giving us high blood pressure and diabetes and hypertension and all of these um, stress induced back pains and, and um, things like that. And something that we've, that we've talked about, we're like, you know, people want to feel like they have their autonomy. People want to feel like they're actually being free to make their own choices. And currently how vertical farming and in, in, in industrial food system works is it really takes that control away from, from the producer and makes it more about yields instead of like quality and of impact. Um, you know, community, uh, resilience and circular economies and really like eliminating waste, something we talked a lot about in our last discussion. Um, and then getting everyone involved in the, in the crop raising, the processing, the, uh, the manufacturing, the distribution. If everyone's involved in that step of the way and we are able, to, we are just changing the, um, our sources to something that's local, then, then that's, everyone benefits from that chain rather than, okay, well, maybe it's a few here, but then ultimately it's a multinational somewhere else that uses a contractor from another state that comes in and does something on the land and then takes it and sells it, you know, for super expensive over here. Meanwhile, the people in the town are hungry. Like <laughs> there's a massive disconnect there. Um, and uh, something I'm working on right now is uh, opening up a small tea shop. Um, we, I talked to Dr. McKinney, who was, um, I'm gonna stop sharing this so I can check Q&A. Um, something I, Dr. McKinney and I were talking about, like, what if we just got made tea that with plants that we recognize have plenty of study and that we see, that we know have impact on how we, um, on our adrenal and, uh, on our adrenal health and our lymph nodes and our lymphatic systems and our uh, our resilience to immunity, uh, like our immune systems and our gut health, because those two things are the most out of whack. And when we're like physically out of balance, we end up being really out of balance with each other. Um, and so that's a, one way that I'm taking number five and applying it is like, well, so let's start with what's stressing everyone out. And if you can just like have some tea and chill for a second, maybe you might be susceptible to these other ideas, these other action items from the paper and, um, you know, raising your own plants and things like that. So um, those are those. And I see, I see some Q and A's, but yeah. Well, then I would, um, I'd just like kind of close on that. This is an ongoing discussion, not just the nutrition piece, First of all, the nutrition, um, this, this part of our conversations, I think, I think we all felt like this needs to be front and center of any kind of healthcare debate or future of farming debate. Um, it really should be one of the primary conversations given what we've seen with COVID-19. So, you know, I think we all encourage all the contributors of this paper, I'll encourage you to go home, um, you know, ready to go to battle for a world filled where people um, all have accessibility to that fundamental human right, which is nutrition. Um, so that's the first thing. And then this is what I was getting ready to say is that this is a, um, these conversations are continuing. So we've already had another conversation that was our largest participating group yet, um, in which we will be getting into the drafting here fairly soon. And that starts looking at the system, the industrial food production system ties um, and transition from slavery and indentured servitude to, to um, uh, how the predatory system still is alive under these extremely vertically integrated and, and more monopolized systems. And it's, it's the farmers, it's, it's the workers. There's a lot of people that are being subjected, but it's also kind of like the mining system. It's extractive and our soil is being mined through this process as well. So. Um, I think like it's going to be really interesting to see how by the time we're through this process, how this next paper comes out. So we ask you to stay tuned for what I think was, I, I know this conversation um, uh, lifted me up quite a ways and helped me um, make some connections that I, I didn't ha completely understand. And I think it will for a lot of people um, as we move forward. Um, 
Dakota, how do you want to go forward? Should we get after Martin Hernandez um, questions here for starts? Yeah, yep, yep. We've got quite a few that have been piling up, so we can just hit them one at a time if that's okay. Um, his first one is, is farming the major economic activity in Nebraska? So over 30% of the economy is the largest, largest part of our economy in the state. Um, so the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, then he goes to dive in deeper. Corn, beans, and soy are the most harvested. Are they the most harvested plants in Nebraska? Corn and soybean primarily followed by wheat. We're a big um, uh, cattle and, and uh, state and a pretty big hog state. Duan, I got some of these from years of USDA research and planted into my mind. So I can probably <laughs> move through a couple of these at least pretty quickly. <laughs> Which fruit or vegetable um, are okay harvested in Nebraska? Is it a lot more than, I know more people are getting into that small farming where they do more, but Largely, is it more than just corn, soy, and then meat? As Duan was saying, there's a lot of room for market development. So one of the key things that has to happen is prioritizing us being able to move into perennial farming like hazelnuts or elderberries. Um, you know, you could think blueberries in Nebraska, you grow really good aronia berries. Those are all highly nutritious. Um, things that grow um, well here that can be turned into um, a system, but the farmer has no market for that right now. And so you can't just grow it because you really don't have anywhere to go. That needs to be refined. Um, and there's a lot of room for that, just as Duana pointed out. But in other, there are pockets of the state where you see black beans, lentils, dry edible beans, garbanzo beans, uh, especially in the western part of the state. Um, you see sugar beets and things like that. Um, and nowhere is completely exempt, just all this land in the state, there's weird, there, you know, there's different things going on kind of all over the place. You know, one of, one of my friends grows watermelon by Elkhorn, you know, so there's a lot of stuff, but I think that um, there needs to be a little bit tweaking. So there's just more emphasis and, you know, the feed the world mentality that people talk about if we grow more on our land and have livestock through our land, we can obviously feed more people than just looking as far as we can see with corn and or soy or one or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think that's an interesting point to make on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know there's a, there's a guy in, um, is it, it's not Scott's Bluff, but he has a total citrus greenhouse. Yeah, that's right, or, Alliance. Alliance, yeah, yeah, that is so, so neat. Um, definitely not in our natural climate, but he made it work, you know? That's right. Yeah. Um, next question. Which organizations are in charge to regulate the farming in Nebraska? Um, this is very multi-layered and complicating for a reason, um, which makes it hard for the general public to be able to maneuver through it. Um, but you have different areas. If you wanted to talk about confinement systems for animals, it would be was formerly known as the Department of Environmental Quality, but now it's the NDEE because they morphed the energy office into it. So it's Nebraska Department of Energy and Environment. Um, the natural resource districts do have a role in making sure our water is in abundance and clean. Um, they do some things on abundance, um, but they've been making exceptions um, as other state laws have been deregulated to allow more of these things to flow in. Um, and on the clean water side, I would just have to say that we need to revisit that because it's not working and our water is degrading quickly. Um, the legislature could be a conduit for um, improved regulations. And if they're not going to do it, we're going to have to take that corporate farming ban back to the ballots so that the people in Omaha are allowed to dictate which way that goes. And I'm sure uh, as we get a more intellectual urban crowd um, uh, in, in this conversation, um, that, you know, when they understand what being downstream truly means, I think that's going to be more of an opportunity for us to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Going a little more specific into that question, Martin's wondering, which is the organization in charge to regulate stock breeding? Is that the same thing or a little more? Specific? I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. Okay. I don't know that for sure personally. Okay. Um, is stock breeding the most greenhouse effect gases? Um, emission activity. Um, what, it, what, is, what does Martin mean by stock breeding specifically? Let's see. I think he might just be referring to livestock. We're waiting on that. As like, as Peggy like, has um, a question and some feedback 
she says, very interesting. Thank you. So sweet, Peggy. Um, you may have addressed this and I missed it. It seems that healthy food costs more than less healthy food, which obviously influences buying choices for a lot of people. What ideas do you have about addressing this? I have several ideas. Dwan, do you want to do you want to kick off or or follow on this one? Yeah, yeah I can kick off. Um, a great approach to that is through your local food systems and by working with the producers, you're able to um, reduce the cost of distribution and um, and and management and refrigeration and things like that that we normally acquire um, through like a national international food import. Um, that put, that raises our costs. And so actually buying locally can be way cheaper if it's done properly. And what we were able to see over the summer, working with uh, especially some local nonprofits who got support in doing this City Sprouts, uh, Big Muddy Urban Farm and Big Garden, we were able to put on a donation-based farmer's market here on 24th Street. Um, and that was just, we recognized that we need more nutrition and more access. And when you're trying to introduce new elements to people's diets, typically making it more expensive is less appetizing. <laughs> um, and so when you make something donation-based um, and you've been able to reduce a lot of the barriers to that, um, there you can, you can ultimately eliminate, even effectively eliminate the cost so that it's just direct access to food. Um, and with, uh, ways that we can address that with farmers who are, you know, maybe in rural, more rural parts of the state is by establishing agreements um, through supermarkets, or I, I would prefer, uh, prefer cooperative markets that are neighborhood based and locally owned, and that have these agreements with, with farmer networks, like Lone Tree Foods, um, like Farm Table, that basically like tap all of these producers, create a catalog, and then you can um, select the producers in the product and bring them into your market and they're all locally sourced. And it creates a direct from producer to consumer relationship rather than um, going to a multinational that has all these sub brands and then everything's processed. And then that's where, um, because, the, because there are so many subsidies in say um, high fructose corn syrup, <laughs> that's where you can get more access to products that are made of it because it's really cheap and there's people who own it. So like it costs them, you know, pennies to produce and it's so they can market it for a buck 50, whereas the apple might be $2 each. So hopefully that answers the question. No, that's, that's awesome. And then I would add that, um, first of all, like some simple things, it's all about that relationship, like skipping all this middle stuff where it's possible and and having the consumer once again know where their food's coming from. Like if we can conquer that and understand where the highly nutritious food is, then you can start to be able to maneuver in this world for starts. Um, so for instance, when I want a grass fed and finished um, cow that, you know, what, what we do, I get go call four of my friends and we buy a whole cow and we, we have it processed and then we split it up and we freeze it. And the per pound um, price of that is when you buy it in bulk in that nature is usually equivalent to what you can buy in the store, um, you know, for at least very close to it. Sometimes you can actually find a really high quality um, protein, meat protein products for the same. Okay, so that's one easy thing you can do. Um, on the other side, Duan kind of got at this, but um, Lone Tree Food is a good example where the farmers um, and, and definitely need to, the consumers do need, definitely need to know these folks, but they're getting a little bit more organized on being able to, to create distribution cities that are funneling more of their product um, like Lone Tree Foods is, which is a group of about 50 young farmers around the, between Omaha and kind of around the Omaha and Lincoln areas that are, are getting more coordinated and, and funneling food to drop off spots around Omaha and Lincoln. And you can already access these products and find a place pretty close to you that you can implement in part of your grocery store uh, routine. Um, and they're also looking to work with other nonprofits, churches, um, or other places to set up drop points. And in some cases, 
in the case of a, a really cool and popular food pantry that we all know, they've even been able to team up that SNAP program, um, that federal farm bill program out of the nutrition title, the farm bill that Dewan talked about to further alleviate this more organized um, system that is connecting the farmers to the consumers. And you can check out Lone Tree Foods by just Googling them. Um, but you can also, which I'm going to put in the comments section, um, open up this Regenerate Nebraska Regeneration Proclamation. Uh, noise is a part of the Regeneration Proclamation Regenerate Nebraska Network, so is GC Resolve. And so there's a vision statement um, that has been um, put together by a lot of different people from a lot of different areas across our state that highlights the vision of the future of agriculture. But in the back, there's a regenerative resource guide um, that, that allows you to have the contact information so you have more options. It's the second edition is the one that I'm posting right now. Um, but you will soon um, should see a third edition coming out with even uh, more, more accessibility options for you. And then, then just a couple of little points on that. Stop drinking, you know, soda pops, you know, the, cut out those fake sugars um, out of your system, save that money, um, cut down on the sweets, the treats, and just the processed food and reinvest that into this portion. And if you're pretty honest with that, give or take, you know, a special day when you need a little psychological reinforce, reinforcement, you earned it. Um, you'd be surprised that you don't have as much of an extra investment as you think, but truly to make all this accessible, the federal farm program needs to support farmers that are growing nutrition. Um, I see you, I've been taking track of the questions and Stacy and, and Ronnie both have some good points. I'm just gonna read them both, but I think there's an opportunity to address both of them because they're both surrounded around education and kind of informing folks. So from Stacy, you've got a um, high school foods culinary teacher in OPS. Awesome. I preach all of this to my students, but I don't really have any kind of curriculum to solidify it at all. Is there a curriculum out there? I would be very interested in how I can help broaden this concept with my students. And then Ronnie asked, do, how do you encourage people to overcome the feeling of being completely overwhelmed and powerless in the face of the change that needs to happen to fix the system? And I think combined, there's there's an opportunity to address both of those points. Um, I'll start, and I, I know Graham has to, would have some really awesome input on this too. Um, well, as, uh, as far as like uh, culinary arts in school, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and fortunately in, o in Omaha, we do have local partners who who spend a lot of time in uh, local food education. So City Sprouts, Big Garden, Big Muddy, um, No Empty Pots, and the uh, Global Roots program through Lutheran Family, Ser uh, Lutheran Family Services, as well as like uh, Mayan Pixum and the Sacred Seed Prod pop up. So we f we are been really fortunate in, the f in recent years to have a number of organizations and initiatives. Uh, Feed the people. Um, uh, yeah. So there's just like there's a whole list of them. Um, we we can share those with you. But I would suggest getting in contact with more people because as far as like a curriculum, i you can find examples online. I've been able to find a few different examples through Twitter um, called the regenerative agenda. Um, so you can see some things in there. Um, but the, how do you overcome the feeling of being completely overwhelmed and powerless? You have to start small. Thinking can be really easy to be like, we have to save the world right now, which we do. We should have said, you need to start yesterday. Um, so yes, the, accident, the existential crisis is, uh, is justified. Um, but to Graham's point earlier, of like these smaller steps of being like cutting out soda, that's, that's process and learn how to make your own syrup. So like you can make, a, I, I remember what blew my mind for the first time was like cola is actually like a plant. And then they made a syrup out of this plant and then added carbonated water to it. And that's how we have like, coke but now coke is a high fructose corn syrup and all these artificial things but like i was like wait cola is a plant and like you can blow people's minds and being like yeah it actually everything that we know to be uh, a flavor was originally plant-based and then we found ways to modify it and so something you can do in your culinary arts class is make a cola soda or make a you know a simple syrup and use a um a soda stream or or like or a bottle of sparkling water and show like you can still have soda without these without these toxic and supporting these particular industries. 
Um, and then I would say like, if you don't have plants at home, like indoors, start raising a plant. Some people are like, I'm not a farmer. It's like, okay, well like raise an herb garden in your window, um, you know, get a lamp and start raising mint. Mint grows very easily and loves to thrive and with just some water and good sunlight, you can have lots of mint and make tea out of it. So like, if you, if you start in those smaller practices in your daily life, it can make it so much more tangible and it helps you understand how these principles and these general applications can be applied in very small ways because that's how a system is built. It's not just like, yeah, there are like laws and things, but it starts with small actions that then compound upon each other. Um, on, the, on the high school side of things, um, for Stacy's question, Oh, that's such a great question. And you know what, like I've been proposing a curriculum redesign or uh, I should say a curriculum design that is an option, an alternative option that more educators could grab. And we just haven't had the resources. But what I will say is we've already had a number of teachers, um, a number of our educators come up and say, geez, like this is needed. We would like to have one that's more focused. Can we be a part of it? So um, Stacy, I just encourage you to keep, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking to more people about this and see maybe where there's an avenue to create a, um, uh, get some resources in so we can create a, a program that would have kind of an advisory committee of educators that would have to carry this out. Um, I kind of know how to maneuver through the State Board of Education. Um, they've been really helpful, you know, in, in that sense. And then I would also add, though, for start, uh, you should check out Kiss the Ground. They released it recently released a documentary on Netflix that Woody Harrelson is a moderator. They talk about this whole piece. Um, but furthermore, Kiss the Ground has does have these, I think they're seven week classes once a week, and they're pretty scientific. And they I've had um we've our organizations have funded some some members, about four or five members of Regenerate Nebraska have pooled money in the past um, to support a group of young people to go through the kiss the ground classes and everyone that took it and it was a it was a real intersectional cool crowd um just they, they were lifted up and it helped like establish like all these conversations in all these areas that i never could have dreamed um you know it just seemed like a fun thing to do and a lot of people are trying to do the right thing so um check out the kiss the ground stuff too and um, I don't know, I think this is something that's going to evolve over time, but is a no brainer. And, and with the right people like you, Stacy, um, we're going to get this more accessible to um, more folks. And then um, Ronnie, yeah, like that question is something I think we all have to ask ourselves every day. But Duan's right, do what you can do, just do something. If everybody can just do a little bit more, um, continually to progress in the form of making life improvements that, that honor your parallel movement with the with nature and the ecosystem um you know just honoring that every day you can add different layers on all the time too whether it's growing a plant or planting a tree or composting or recycling or you know getting a little bit more involved in one of the many organizations that Dewan talked about or anyone in that regenerate nebraska network of 86 you know groups um the conservation nebraska who's holding this i mean get around these, get educated, meet the people that are doing the stuff on the ground, and then find out like what, what is the best fit for your life because our own individuality, as long as we're seeking truth and what we're interested in, will, and that intuition that we all have will guide us and put us in the right place if we just allow to be open to it. Um, so, you know, put yourself in the place that you wanna be in and I think that always, I've found, opens more doors to um, more opportunities for regeneration. Absolutely. Um, and a great point you made earlier, Graham, was composting. I think that's an awesome place to start. And Stacey, you mentioned you do culinary arts within uh, the schools. So then talk about what you do with the things that after you cook, when you're preparing some, when you're preparing your meal, what do you do with all the trash and the waste? Like have a deliberate conversation about that. If somebody came in a packaging, let's talk about where it goes. Um, you, you know, you can just, I, something I love doing is actually explaining composting to kids like under 10 because it blows their mind. And they're just like, that makes so much sense. Of course you would do that. And then if you explain to them how like landfills work, they're like, why would you do that? 
you yell at us all the time for like leaving our anything on the ground but you literally go then like collect it all in bags and then go put it in the ground somewhere else like it they're horrified and so if you can so if you can make the connection of of like you know eating food every day and then what happens to the packaging and the wrappers and what they get out of um there's a great series on youtube called think bioplastic that i watched the other day um i'll grab the link and drop it in the chat it helped me it, it's really entertaining she has like a fun british accent it's like there's lots of little short vignette clips and stuff but it breaks down the science behind raising plants to make polymers to make plastics that are biodegradable and compostable so that we could ultimately replace a lot of the plastics that we use currently with these things I mean she goes through the pitfalls and the challenges and the opportunities um, and how things like we could you we could raise hemp in Nebraska use the oil and the fibers to produce um, polymers that make compostable silverware you know what I mean so like there's and then what we're doing that whole way through is creating a whole new localized economy that also addresses our waste management effectively eliminating it since it can all be returned back to the earth um so there's a ton of resources now more than ever that help us um that, that can help us reframe and basically just like like not keep doing what we're doing because we really need to change but ultimately you can placing things that we've been doing that are with plant-based and you wouldn't even really be able to tell the difference. Um, so. Thank you both. <laughs> um, going back to Martin's question, he did clarify. Um, and I think he is just kind of um, asking about the different environmental impacts that raising cattle can have on the environment rather than say raising corn or growing corn more like. Um, and, you know, to your point, Graham, you were speaking about how it is beneficial. But of course, in our system today, I don't think the bigger corporations are using that as beneficial right now. So would you say once it is um, utilized within the vegetation, it's it kind of balances out? Yeah, I would. Um, and I can I can peel off another layer of that, I think. So just think about, you know, pre um, colonial times in our country and the spread of the pioneers and what the North American continent looked at that point, um, which as far as emission levels, um, you know, things seemed to be more harmonious and in sync. Um, you know, you had the massive bison herds rummaging across and and you know, kind of think, kind of think of that picture. Well, it's 2020, and a lot's changed, and there's more people here. And so, you know, what do you, you know, you can't just bring back bison herds. Everyone would say, and and maybe maybe that would be tricky. But um, what's happened is that we've so aggressively gone away from that kind of thought process of management that was naturally here before, even in the past 40 years, which is the length of my life essentially. Um, we have drastically changed um, what we're doing out there. Almost all farmers, when I was a young person, um, had, used to have uh, livestock that run across their land. And those livestock would do a lot of the fertilization. And so what does that mean? There was less synthetic nitrogen that was being produced by chemical companies um, that's leading to drastic increases in nitrous oxide, which is way more potent to the atmosphere than rising CO2 levels. Um, that's what's happened. And we're paying companies something we don't need to pay them to be able to produce the synthetic nitrogen that we were doing on our own um, for as long as we can remember. This is all like really new. And that's like why we're kind of like this guinea pig generation and we're starting to see things what seem like unravel somewhat. Um, we wanna get back into that sink. So, so what happens is if you add the biodiversity, you add another layer of plant growth and that takes down the carbon dioxide. Then you release the animals out of the confinement system and these massive runoff situations, no vegetation in the, in the feedlot systems and heavy methane emission pockets. And you, dis, you disperse them into more of their ruminant um, uh, lifestyle and for longer periods of their life. And you try to get them back essentially quickly across every acre. 
with more grazing feed in between the corn and the beans and the weed and whatever else is going forth. Now you have just by introducing a couple things that are very traditional to our farming culture, um, which is which is more grazing material and then just simply livestock grazing. You have drastically re reduced CO2 emissions. You have drastically reduced nitrous oxide emissions, and you and you start to see a reversal of the impacts of methane as well. So that's that's what we're that's the um, generalized picture of of kind of how that system um, pulls together, and and um, and that vision can further respect the natural rotation of the bison. Um, in which our ecosystem was was a little bit more in balance or quite a bit more in balance than it is right now. Yeah, there, there are awesome examples um, all across Wyoming. I was there recently this summer and was able to see like the drastic difference between um, be, between like a more sustainable and traditional form of farming to the more conventional and like hyper specialized. And you would see these like unnaturally green areas that were like, that's really green. It should not be that green. That's not okay. Like there's something about it that looks like radioactive or some type of toxic. And, but then you would go by these other areas that had lots of more natural grazing that were right off of small streams that had higher water retention. And because of how the seeds, how the rows were planted, it did a better job of, of using the sediment and the soil and the root systems to clean that water. Um, and so you're able to improve the quality of the watershed while also, in, while also improving your stock yeah, your, your stock and um, crop yields. I mean, there's whole approaches that are like, we've been doing since the beginning of time, but now we're in this place where we've tried to like hyper advance it so much and to like make things really complicated that it's becoming really harmful. Um, and so like literally life can just be a lot simpler if we allow it to be in a good best way best way to do that is to start with is soil education um, at a really basic concept to help people understand like soils where everything comes from everything we're wearing everything that is a material around us something had to come had to grow from there and then be transformed or was beneath the soil you know like when you when you can make that connection you go oh okay well then stop doing that thing that we're doing um, and we can start to see these like really a much more accessible and tangible transformations in a very short period of time. Um, it, like in a in a season, we can see massive transformations in fields. Like I've I've seen before and after pictures that Graham has posted of you know doing cover crops in certain areas or visiting farms that have you know changed some of their uh, practices and like how in a season to three seasons you can see a massive transformation in that ecosystem um, that shows that this works. Um, you just have to do it. Yeah, and it's so crazy to me how many solutions are out there at this point, you know, like there really are, there's such an abundance and I think that too overwhelms people um, in a good way, <laughs> but it's, it's incredible that it, it, it's so systematic at this point that it's taking so much to break it, you know. Um, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but I've always wondered why like bakers or these big supermarket chains don't have like a section for a localized produce. I know that they would need some sort of director, but I feel like that would even just be a great way to give these local, you know, farmers just a space to put whatever they have there, you know, because everyone that, you know, that's a kind of supermarket that most people have access to. And so that would also give them access to these different localized um, sources. Do you think that could ever be a thing? Yeah, um, I just like I've had a rough time um, understanding like why um, in Omaha there's not accessibility, more accessibility to local farmers. Luckily, Lone Tree's here with the drop spots, but more of a market type place is needed. Um, Probably, um, you know, there's, I think that in East Omaha, especially, um, there's many appropriate places for cooperative systems. And I think that you could automatically, even if you started small, bring in someone like Lone Tree that could help establish a basic deal and, and then help create spaces for more farmers like our, us who are just one hour out of town who are starting to 
convert from the old conventional style on the my my um, family, you know, my parents basically had transitioned to, and now we're pulling back in some of the customs that my grandpa, you know, and his ancestors were using. Um, but we have more technology and we want to fulfill the local market and we want to work with Omaha. And so we need more of those kind of opportunities as farmers to be able to get our food supply in there or have a place to go just period. So um, I think that, you know, this is something that needs to happen. I will say, um, the overarching um, kind of organizational structure of Open Harvest in Lincoln, the co-op there. Um, I, I would, um, I've talked to the guy that is headquarters, the guy that runs the national office who offer assistance to those co-ops through other meetings here fairly recently. And he said, oh, Omaha is a big spot we're missing. We would love to to work with you know a community in Omaha area to to launch something we can help like understand all the options whoever that would be and and I just think someone you know um, there for someone out there that's their role you know as as Ronnie was asking there's someone out there that that's their role and we're always wondering you know who might be that person and and um, we have the connections um, you know we come with a lot of those and and so we want to be able to share them so that these things can happen so all of us have a, a better community um, to your question about super local supermarkets I mean what's great about Omaha is that we're I'd let's say we're like one degree separation so if you know someone who works at a grocery store who is the manager who is even a cashier like a place of natural grocer like like bakers, like Hy-Vee. Hy-Vee actually has a pretty, does a pretty good job with their local connections. I know that they carry a lot more local products than some other distributors do. Um, I've seen Family Fair carry some more regional, small producer things as well. Um, but I think just being more explicit about that and if, and if um, you know, local markets are hearing demand, that's what they respond to. Um, you know, they, and they look at they look at numbers, they chart those numbers, and they make purchasing decisions based off of that. And so, if you see in, in like the bakers on Saddle Creek um, and Leavenworth, uh, um, and you know, increase their organic selection significantly in the last you know ten years because they started noticing that there's a massive market for it. And that people were demanding and asking for it and seeking and seeking alternatives and you know the organic can be quote better in some circumstances there's still like a really high emission rate that goes with that because we don't produce a lot of organic produce locally um i had noticed that bakers at one point that they had signs with pictures of farms that are like nebraska and iowa i've never personally followed up on those so i just have to take their word on their marketing um so it appears that there are some types of, uh, there are some products there that are regional at least, um, but I think just like higher demand and more intentionality. So calling bakers me like, I love you guys. I would love you more if you had regional produce. And then if you can connect them to people like Graham or with folks within uh, the, their Generate Nebraska network, then suddenly there's resources. Cause I'm sure like, it sounds like a good idea what do we do? And so if you can give an action item to someone and you're like saying, hey, this is, I think this is important to me and my community. Here's what you can do about it. Here's who you talk to to make that happen and be willing to like foster those relationships. And you can start with just like your, your local bakers or the high bee that you go to and just start asking questions about where things come from. Suddenly like those local relationships and those intentional conversations and access and connecting people to resources like well, the ones we've talked about tonight can start to have those like those ripple effects. And then there, then with examples like Open Harvest and having conversations in Omaha, suddenly you can start pointing to examples of, well, they're doing it over there or exists green. Uh, Lee Neary gets all of her produce from local producers and it's zero waste. Like, how can we have those types of things in our grocery stores? And suddenly you, you start to see an ecosystem that responds um, and then that can lead into some, to like some very tangible changes in a very short period of time. And the consumer base has the numbers. Um, the urban communities have the numbers, not the farm. So the power is with the, in the urban areas and that consumer base they will dictate the future of farming and the direction it goes, if it will be regenerative or not, if it will, if it will you know, have that soil and nutrition health and the soil health and nutrition emphasis. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's my challenge is that 
um, you know, and I'm, I'm a part of this too, because we're all consumers, but, but that, that the, that you don't feel removed from the system as an urban resident, that you know that you have an equal stake here. As a matter of fact, you have more power in the conversation than someone, you know, like, like myself as a basic farmer does. Um, we have to follow what you do. We're changing because we know there's right, there's a current market, but for all these other folks to come along, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna need to match those all, people all up with the consumer. <clears throat> Well, awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. That was so much great information. Um, do you have anything else you want to leave with everybody? Yes, um, I would suggest um, in, in the summertime or moving into the growing season, actually starting conversations now, but thinking about what your local market looks like. Um, small neighborhood markets are a great a way to um, start providing access to these things. I know that in a lot of suburban communities, it can be difficult to have get access to fresh produce um, within your immediate vicinity. And may, you may have to drive um, to other markets or um, they're located, they're centrally located. And so you can't just like walk to the market. And so if you can do something um, adjacent to local parks or within a community center or something like that to provide access, um, drop off points because I understand COVID is can be a barrier in some ways. Um, you can do socially distanced markets like we did over the summer with the Fair Deal Farmers Market um, that was donation based. Um, just start looking into ways that you can bring food where you are, whether that's just, you know, a, a couple of houses that are growing food and you guys decide to do a, a, sh a shared exchange, I'm growing carrots, you're growing beets, we'll exchange, those types of things, um, to, um, you know, working with the health department, talking to um, the Gifford Park Neighborhood Associ the neighbor Association who has their neighborhood market, um, the Omaha Farmers Market, um, guild and see how we can figure out the um getting these smaller points in our communities even if they're seasonal that way you're suddenly like starting to break down and show that um we can decentralize our, our food distribution um and then support your local markets and um lone tree um you know um farm table um, there's Aster Acre Cooperative, which is a group on Facebook, who is a group of small farmers and, and urbanites who are like, we want to figure out how to provide mutual exchange and mutual aid. So if you, if you like are interested in this stuff, make a group about it with some other people who are interested too, and then figure out small ways to practice, like bake each other cakes or something. Um, and you will start to get in the practice of what it looks like to take these principles at a scale yeah and i would add um i think that um there is a you know a, a real opportunity at unification of the partisans um that make up our legislature around expanding uh meat packing because you know that's another hindrance that's out there that you, you would you believe there's not a really um, well, there's one in Iowa, um, but there's not really a you know chicken processor around the area um, for the small guys, like period. So what does that mean that you don't see much of that around? Um, I, it sounds like the legislature has got a possibility of addressing this year. And I'm hearing um, both, uh, you know, both kinds of leadership out there that have interest in this because people on the ground have been demanding this already. This is one of the things that could unlock those herds of livestock back onto the ground and help fill in those areas of, of insecurity. And so, and if we get another coronavirus funding um, out of the situation, which is looking more and more likely, you know, as, as the, the administration's transition, um, it, you know, that money would come back to Nebraska, a chunk of that. And last time our state did not invest in the food infrastructure um, or processing where several other states did. Um, I know some senators that were upset how that money was utilized. And I know specific senators that would like to see that money utilized to invest in these new businesses to help open up these regional local markets. So if that's not an opportunity sitting right in front of us out of everything that's talking about, I don't know what is. On, and then I would also on the food hub development, um, to increase accessibility through maybe partner nonprofits, organizations, um, neighborhoods, uh, whatever works for, for you, like Dewan was saying, um, 
I think that we can help like uh, put together some food drops with groups like Lone Tree Foods right now um, and, and some places and that, you know, if there's people that really want to help lead those kind of community efforts, uh, this is all about infrastructure development in order to, to, to improve our nutrition and increase our national security. And so, um, you know, these are the areas that, that we love to get involved with and, and a lot of members in the Regenerate Network can step up and lend a hand as they have to a couple other communities um, that were looking to break down some of those barriers here recently. Um, and l l this last comment, I, um, I subscribe to Norm Empty Pots and they have a, um, they've been doing a seasonal CSA. And so I get a box every Saturday um, with local produce in it. And it's incredible. Like just a simple thing, you know, it's donation based. And so if you can't pay, they, you know, still bring it to you anyway. And they also do prepared meals. Um, so that's an organization that you can look into their model and support them as well as maybe find some elements that you'd be interested in. But it's great because I just got, I get like delicata squash and potatoes and, you know, it, it's reg it's a uh, seasonal, um, you know, they give me a piece of paper that says who everything came from, who everyone came from, and then a recipe on the back about what you can do with it. And that's just like a really solid implementation of, you know, people are into food deliveries for a variety of reasons right now why not make it all local food delivery? Um, and it comes in a cardboard box so you can burn it or compost it. Um, so there's all like those little things that, um, and examples that we have that are working in a really robust manner. Right now, No Empty Pots is serving over thousands of people right now um, and have been doing a lot of work throughout the pandemic to yeah. respond to food insecurity and needs. Yeah, shout out to No More Empty Pro uh, No No More Empty Pots. They're one of the, We've named a bunch of awesome groups here, including Conservation Nebraska, but No More Empty Pots certainly is one of them going above and beyond right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. You can sign up right now for the CSA. Yeah, they're, they're in there. When they, yeah, the fact that it's going all year is incredible. Um, a lot of CSAs are like May through September usually, um, but this one, they've been able to secure enough partnerships with like local squash and root producers. So they've been able to get some solid like cold weather crops, um, including cabbages all the way through to right now. And they have, I think they have one more season, um, one more session left of the year. And it's been a saving grace to have, be able to have access to fresh produce in addition to you know bulk grains and rice and other things that I've been able to purchase. So um, there are food buying clubs that people are like putting in bulk orders on black beans and rice. Um, take advantage of those types of things and start thinking about staple foods that you can go in and make bulk purchases of like meats and other things. Um, Cause there's gonna be a cold winter and there's gonna be a lot of just like insecurity about a lot of things. And so the first thing that we can start to work on securing is our food cause we need it to live. <laughs> <laughs> great way to end <laughs> thank you both so much oh my gosh you i know you put so much heart into that paper alone so for you guys to be here and talk about it means a lot so it was an honor to partner with dewan on this uh, really enjoyed that part that pro part of the process and we had a pretty awesome group didn't we <laughs> definitely sounds like it well thanks for putting all that work in you guys and doing this tonight. I know you're probably tired. So go get some sleep, go rest and <laughs> snuggle up. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, everyone for being here. Have a great night. Bye.